Hi guys. Sorry about that little break. I had to go save my burning brownies. But anyway, we are now in the middle of chapter 26 as we start to wind down Peruvian Plunge where I finally working my way into the Amaracari Communal Reserve in Chintuya, Peru. It is now Wednesday, July 22nd, 2009. <clears throat> I was awakened at 4 a.m. by the rodent-like rustlings of hunt oil planet eaters milling about in the hotel courtyard outside my door. Minutes later, I could hear them setting off in their expensive trucks to planet-eating parts unknown an hour before the sun rose. What the hell shenanigans were they up to now? I had no time to worry about the mysterious life of planet-eaters because I had to be on my own bus back to Shintuya before 6 a.m. There were actually two buses running from Salvacion to Shintuya that, that day at 6 a.m. I never figured out this classic Peruvian exercise in inefficiency where some days there would be one bus and other days there would be two buses running the identical route. On the days when there were two buses, you might think that one bus would leave Salvacion at 6 a.m. and the other bus might leave at, say, noon, but you would be wrong, you stupid gringo. <clears throat> Seeing as how I actually had a choice of buses, I went with the big green bus as opposed to the little blue bus. Our big green bus pulled out of the starting gate, the little bus fast on our heels like a beagle chasing a St. Bernard. Whenever the bus I was on would stop to pick up passengers, the other bus would race around us to claim the next fare. Then, of course, we would do, to the, do the same thing to them when they were stopped to pick up passengers. This game of bus leapfrog went on for two hours and, until the two half-empty buses pulled into their destination at the same time, only to turn around and start the entire process again back to salvation each half full. I don't know what to say. There's just some fundamental disconnect going on down here that gringos simply can't fathom. I'm quite sure there is a perfectly good explanation for why you can have your choice of two buses at 6 a.m. in Salvacion, Peru, and then have to depend on logging trucks to save your ass for the remaining 23 hours and 50 minutes, 59 minutes of the day because there are no more buses running. I just haven't figured it out yet. It was right about 8 a.m. as I was walking into the lodge that I bumped into a friendly trio of Peruvian tree huggers. You heard me right, there really are tree huggers in Peru coming out. One of the guys was from the Amazon Conservation Association, an organization that I have been trying to track down for weeks with no luck. The others were from an outfit called Parks Watch. While I had been jacking around with that goddamn bag of cannonballs the previous day and night, I had missed a golden opportunity to spend an evening getting to know these guys. The three of them had no clue that Hunt Oil was going to be in Shintuya that very day. Excited by this news, they sat out, they set out with me into town so we could get the details on the time and place for this a crucial meeting so we could all attend. It was during that search that we smacked into Moose and the Hunt Oil bigwigs coming out of the meeting, which had begun at 6.30 a.m. and was the reason the Planet Eaters had gotten up at 4 a.m. 
you've already heard the tale about the meek inheriting the earth but not the mineral rights so I don't need to repeat that story here since we had missed the meeting conveniently enough for Hunt Oil and since I fucked up by running off to Salvation to deal with my second bag of cannonballs we held a quick tree-hugging huddle down by the pecky pecky dock under the suspicious eyes of the villagers. As we huddled, exchanging email addresses and bits of hunt oil gossip, a small flock of ragged chickens began pecking in the dirt around our feet. Now this is how to get a planet-wide revolution in consciousness into high gear, I thought, looking around the dismal scene that looked like something straight out of Tennessee Williams' nightmares. <coughs> My new friends abandoned me less than an hour after we had met so they could go check out this place upriver they heard so much good stuff about, a place called... Manu Learning Center. They hopped into a fancy tour boat. The captain cranked up the 60 horsepower gasoline outboard and the Amazon conservationist and parks watchers disappeared up the mother of God leaving me alone again. I headed back towards the lodge to catch up on my riding and stopped in at Ramon's house on my way up the hill. Ramon had just come from the meeting with Hunt Oil and I could tell he was agitated about whatever had just gone down there. Bureaucracy number one needed him to gather some information for an emergency meeting they had scheduled for August 3rd. In addition, he had overlooked an ayahuasca session he had scheduled for July 31st. The frazzled harem boot shaman sat at, sat at his formica table with his appointment book and his pen. His handsome brow furrowed in frustrated concentration like he tried while he tried to figure out how he was going to balance fighting big oil leading an ayahuasca session and taking the crazy gringo from Texas on a trip to a sacred singing rock. Ramon was one busy man and one powerful man, but he wasn't Superman. Something about seeing the guy, the same man I had heard talking about fighting a snake in an ayahuasca vision while I was tripping on San Pedro, sitting there at his depressing little table with his depressing little appointment book and his depressing little pen, started to really depress me. I am so sorry, Samuel, he told me. I just don't see how I'm going to have the time to take you back to Amana. He introduced me to his buddy, some, some kid slouching instantly in a hammock in the corner, chain-smoking cigarettes. Ramon said the kid could take me back to Amana. I looked over to my left shoulder for advice. Spirit was nowhere to be seen. Listen, Ramon, I said, I'm, I'm going to go to Nueva Eden for a few days. We'll figure out the, Oma, the Amana trip when I get back, okay? Translation, you and I will be going to that sacred rock like we'll be hopping a jet plane to New York. I left Ramon at his little Formica table that he loved so much, still hunched over his appointment book in a cloud of cigarette smoke from the little punk in the hammock, and headed back to the lodge to get back to the tale of my revolution fomenting spiritual quest. I stopped by the lodge just long enough to heat up a cup of coffee on the gas stove. Gracias, Hunt Oil! then took my Mickey Mouse notebook and ballpoint pen down to the banks of the Mother of God. I don't care how many times I walk 
from one of the depressing towns along this river to the river itself, the startling contrast between the absolute desperation and poverty and garbage of the towns and the peaceful healing solitude of the river not five minutes away from their village centers never fails to bowl me over. The other startling facet of the difference between these two worlds five minutes apart from each other is the absence of people along the river. It would not surprise me one bit if more than half the population, if not 90% of Shintoya or Salvacion or Santa Cruz had not taken the five minute walk in years preferring instead the comforts of their dirt floor hovels and the mind-numbing drug of their televisions. Peruvians are not the only ones susceptible to this plastic bauble seduction. I've noticed the very same thing with gringo eco-tourists who spend thousands of dollars to come to the Amazon or the beaches in Costa Rica and then choose to while away their precious few vacation hours in their comfortable eco-lodges instead of on the banks of some bug-infested, snake-filled jungle river. Can't imagine why they would. <clears throat> Bucking the trend of the locals and the eco-tourists alike, I walked along the riverbank until I found my perfect tranquil power spot, a driftwood log in a soft pocket of sand in the shade of a cecropia tree, right beside a tiny waterfall pouring out of the forest and onto the beach. I slathered myself with deet meditated for a few minutes to get myself in the necessary peaceful frame of mind for eight hours of writing, then picked up my pen and plunged back into my rambling saga. Within minutes, I had floated away into the parallel universe of the spiritual travelogue writer, leaving my peaceful haven on the banks of the Mother of God behind me. I had not been writing for more than 15 minutes when I suddenly, when I was suddenly and violently ripped out of my other world by the angry scream of a fucking chainsaw coming from just the other side of the river. No! I was 100% sure there were no roads within 50 miles of that side of the river, which was no doubt the reason it still was home to some primary rainforest. Full of the towering kapok trees and other jungle giants that support such an incredible biodiversity of life, I vaguely recalled that the village boundaries of Shinturia actually extended to that side of the river. That part of the village, in turn, was surrounded by the uninhabited cultural zone, read the logging zone of Manu National Park, the chainsaws ruining my day and my life were being operated by none other than the harem boot Indians themselves. After raising virtually every tree on the highway side of their village, and frustrated by the Peruvian government's refusal to let them move their chainsaws into the million acres of primary forest still standing inside of Maracare, where the tribe had somehow managed to live for thousands of years without chainsaws, the natives had taken their assault against Gaia across the river by boat. Every hour or so, in fact, a boat from the village side of the river would motor over to the wild side and load up a dozen or so huge slabs of rough sawn lumber to take to God only knows where to sell to God only knows who, 
no doubt the U.S. and China for God only knows how much or how little money. The entire sick, twisted tragedy of the whole ugly mess left me feeling entirely helpless, entirely alone in the world, there on the banks of the Mother of God. It was so easy for me to sit there in my high and mighty gringo arrogance and blame the harem boots for their greed and their ignorance and their myopic lack of vision. As far as I could tell, there was no sign that they had ever even considered replanting the areas they had ravaged years ago. What the fuck were they going to do after they finished raping the other side of the river? Go work for Walmart? But I knew the even uglier, more sinister truth of the desperate situation. The natives would not be over there with their chainsaws if it were not folks lining up in the U.S. and China and Japan and India and Europe to purchase the lumber they were cutting. And until we pull our heads out of our asses long enough to see the light and to find some way to convince these natives and millions of other rainforest dwellers all over this planet that it is in their economic best interest to leave the virgin forest standing than it is to destroy it, the trees are going to continue to fall and fall and fall, ecotourism and medicinal plants. Please. Well, there was at least one thing this former real estate agent from Texas could do to take some direct action to save at least a few of these precious jungle giants. He could take 20 grand out of his Roth IRA and go buy a bunch of them before the human termites got to them with their chainsaws. But, as Tello had explained to me, I was just a few years too late if I hoped to do that anywhere upstream from Itawania, where the road to salvation in China already ran. I would have to get beyond the end of the road. I would have to go as far as New Eden. You gotta love the dark irony of the names of the villages and the Mother of God to find any big trees left to save or buy in the Peruvian Amazon. And that adventure would have to wait one more day. And that wraps up chapter 26, leading us to the penultimate chapter of Peruvian Plunge, chapter 27, into the Peruvian Garden of Eden, coming right up. Bye, guys.